It is six o'clock. It is March 12th of 2024. And it's time to call to order this meeting of the council committee. Um, I'll begin this evening with the roll call. Ms. Kittrell, if you would, please. Vice Mayor Love. Here. Councilman Carter. Present. Councilman Fan. Here. Councilman Fennell. Here. Councilwoman George. Here. Councilman Hayes. Present. And Councilman Juvance. Present. Mayor, we have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Kittrell. Um, this evening, you do have two sets, sets of minutes for your consideration. The first are from the February 13th Council Committee meeting, and the second are from the February 27th Council Committee meetings. Move to approve both. Second. I have a motion by Councilwoman George, a second by Vice Mayor Love. Are there any corrections or additions requested? Seeing none, all in favor of approving both sets of minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. They are unanimously approved. We'll move now to public recognition. I do want to read through this evening's agenda because I've had several people express confusion to me today. So um, the first item tonight is a dangerous building show cause hearing for 518 Red River Road. The second is a dangerous building show cause hearing for 507 Carson Street. The third is um, where I think the confusion has been. This is a resolution allowing the mayor to sign a memorandum of understanding for a project called Project Phoenix, actually called Project Phoenix prior today. There's no reason to continue to call it that. But um, it is not to approve any kind of project for downtown. It is just to explore feasibility of a project for downtown and how that might work for the city, for the merchants, for the residents, and for the taxpayers. Um, item number four is ordinance 02403-14, and that's an ordinance amending Gallatin Municipal Code related to um, energy conservation um, requirements, and this is um, to become compliant with the state's latest legislation. Um, item five is Ordinance 02403, which is authorizing um, um, GPU to use $330,000 for water line replacement on Franklin Street. And item six is resolution R2403-21, which is resolution accepting public improvements by the city of Gallatin from Carrollton. Um, so that's the agenda for this evening. We will go um, through it, but right now it's time for public recognition. At a committee meeting, we have all of our public recognition at the beginning of the meeting. So whether you have an item that you want to speak to that is on the evening's agenda or one that's not on the agenda, this would be your time to speak. You have five minutes. We ask that you introduce yourself, give us your name and your address for the record, and then you will have five minutes, and you'll hear my phone alarm go off when that five minutes is up. But right now, public recognition is now open. Hi, I'm Sandra Kelly. I live at 103 Jones Street here in Gallatin. And first of all, I would like to know whoever ma if whoever makes these can put the page number after the item that the particular information starts on. So you don't have to scroll through 100 or 200 pages. Can I interject with you? There's a bookmark tab, and you hit that bookmark, and the item will come up on the side, and then you can just hit that, and it'll take you right to it. But that's, okay. not still, that's still not a bad idea for people that may be scrolling. And yeah, because I've had to do that before, and I did not notice the bookmark. Thank you. Um, okay. And I want to speak to item number three. First of all, this is not on there. Where did the money come from to do the study just to put together the presentation that the developers are going to give us tonight? I'm sure that was not free. This is the first I've heard of this. I say no in this financial and climate in the country when nobody has any money. And I know it wouldn't be five to t it would be five or ten years before it even gets approved. But we don't have any extra money for that. And if it comes to the point where the citizens have a say, I think we need to vote on it. And it needs to be very clear when and how it's going to be done. Because I have a feeling a lot of people are going to vote no, because I've been reading the comments. And to tear down buildings like this, to build new ones, I don't see the point. Also, there will be more traffic. 
And right now we're fighting the traffic on Main Street. As I've said before at this podium, you can't even walk around Main Street and have a conversation because of the big trucks and the everything that's going, the traffic is so loud. You can't just have a jaunt around and talk. And let's see. I already got all my points in, and I just don't think we have the money to do it. We're just, we're, I'm poor. I don't know how many rich people live here, but I'm very, I get by, and that's about it. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Todd Alexander, 217, Strange Circle. Uh, I also want to speak to item three tonight. Uh, and what blew me away was a project of this size and scope truly changing downtown it gets dropped in a work session with request to spend money to uh, study it and look at the feasibility of it. I don't get to every meeting, but uh, I don't even remember there being a time where this was even kicked around. Uh, at a meeting, unless it was years and years and years ago before I moved to Gallatin in 2012. Um, where did this come from? And it just seems like it, boom, just appeared. And when you talk to people, kind of like what Miss Kelly just said, nobody seems to know anything about this. Uh, my memory may not be the best, but it seems like almost a million dollars had to come from our reserves this year to make the budget work. And then I see this project and I'm going, how's that gonna happen? How are, are we gonna develop something like this? And uh, uh, of course, the first thing that comes to my mind is it's gonna be on the taxpayer back somewhere down the road. And uh, I don't just, I don't see a way around it. If development um, paid for itself, like um, sometimes people say, we should be swimming in money because we have had development like crazy in Gallatin. Uh, you've heard all the numbers about our growth, you know them. But what really got me was as I, I searched to try to find out more about this when I first looked at the agenda and thought we had an easy night. Uh, <laughs> and I said, what is Project Phoenix? And I did a search. And I began to see articles, uh, the Nashville Business Journal, maybe they didn't represent the city well, but the headline says Gallatin commits to major downtown development. That's what they say. Gallatin gets it websites. Gallatin city officials announced plans to transform downtown blocks to a live work order. That sounds like a done deal. And I, I'm sure it's not. I've heard the, the mayor, I heard your comments that this is a permission to do an MOU to, to look at it, but uh, when you when you look around at what uh, people are saying, uh, they're they're saying this this thing is done, and I just uh, that's what got me is is that this thing just got bombshell dropped tonight. So uh, I just think things of this magnitude should be discussed uh, at great length of you know talking about is this something we want to do? What would it look like? And I don't remember that being discussed in this room. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Brown and council members. I'm Michelle Juvance, 1335 Long Hollow Pike. I was wanting to just ask some questions about number three, about Project Phoenix. Um, I have just things that just came to my mind that I would like you all to consider and ask when, when you're looking at this project. Um, Number one is why would we give the land to the IDB and are we going to give it to them for free? Um, how much is this six point whatever acres appraised for? And will the IDB give the land to the developer for free? <clears throat> At what point in the process does the city deed the land to the IDB? Um, the only reason I can think of for the IDB to own the property is to give the development a pilot, which is a payment in lieu of tax agreement. Unless the city's not allowed to negotiate with developers, I thought maybe that's the reason they would give the land to the IDB. So 
I don't know if, as the city, if we are allowed to actually negotiate with developers. Um, if the IDB owns the land, but the city owns all the buildings, which would be the city hall, the fire station, the police station, the chamber building, the farmer's market building, do we pay rent to the IDB? And who is going to have the liability insurance on all the public buildings and parking lot if the IDB is owning the land and we're still using the buildings? Um, I know that the city is required to buy the Chamber of Commerce building from them. Uh, if it's just going to be torn down and demolished, are we going to pay them for the building that is on city land and then turn around and tear it down? So if that's the case, like, how do we know, like, how do we appraise something like that, knowing that that building is just going to be demolished? Um, so I know that the relocation of the fire hall has been discussed and presented at previous budget hearings and the dollar amount um, that was listed at those budget hearings to build a new fire hall was between four to five million dollars. Um, the estimated cost in 2022 to build a new fire station was $550 a square foot. So I'm wondering how much is that now? Um, this is the first I've heard of relocating the police station. So how much will it cost to build a new police station and where will that location be? Um, do we need to buy land for that new police station location? Uh, why would we tear down a perfectly good city hall building and then build a new one at almost exactly the same location? Uh, does this plan entail using the existing building and just turning it sideways? which seems like a silly waste of money, um, which I guess if it was your money, you could do whatever you want with it, but it's our money that you guys are talking about spending. Um, so that seems like a waste of hard-earned taxpayers' dollars. And how much is it gonna cost to build a new building for the city hall or to turn it sideways and reuse the same existing building, whichever is being talked about doing? Um, so if they want to tear everything down um, to make money, these developers, should they, are they going to be paying for all the new buildings? And if not, wouldn't it just be better for us if they just bought land downtown from some private owner and built their own apartment and hotel? Because that way we would still keep our own buildings, not have to buy new ones, but we would still get the tax money from them building a development. Um, so if the project goes forward, as shown, will we be paying rent on the land where the city hall is located? So how is that gonna work? Um, and then who's gonna be paying for the parking garages? And I wanna know, um, will the city issue a bond to pay for all these new buildings? And how much money are we gonna have to borrow to build these new buildings? And to be able to qualify for that much of a bond, our, is our tax rate going to have to go up? Are we going to have to raise the city um, citizens' taxes? So those are pretty much the questions that I had on my mind. Thank you. Good evening, uh, my name is Nancy Edwards, 423 Deveron Drive in Gallatin. Um, switching topics here, where the new McDonald's is being built on Big Station Camp just before Long Hollow Pike, um, they took out the stop sign that leads into the retail shopping area or exiting the retail shopping area so they could pour their sidewalks. Well, they've almost done they just stopped pouring the sidewalk, but they still haven't put the stop sign back. And I have a major concern about that because I like to walk my dog through the area, and there's been too many times where I've almost been hit. My dog and I have almost been hit because people making a right turn onto Big Station Camp barely stop at the stop sign, and with no stop sign there at all, I'm even more concerned. So that's my one issue. If somebody from engineering could get hold of McDonald's and tell them to put the stop sign back up. Uh, the other concern is, and I think I've brought this up before, uh, the amount of traffic that we're expecting 
to come through the Newman's Crossing townhomes because of the uh, new McDonald's with a double drive-through. Um, the residents, we've been, we've been having our own community meetings. They have asked if it would be possible to have some type of signage put up saying residents only. We know we can't block off the street. We can't put a gate up because it's a public street. But because the streets in that home de townhome development are so much more narrow than regular traffic streets, there's a big concern that somebody's going to get hit. Kids are going to get hit because we have kids running around all over the place, people out walking their pets, and that somebody's going to decide to cut through the townhome development and somebody's going to get hit or worse. So thank you very much for your time. That's all I had. Is there anyone else wishing to speak under public comment? Seeing none, public comment is closed. Um, Mr. Stewart. I know you have my cell phone number. Would you please give it to Ms. Edwards because you should not have to come up here to get those concerns addressed. Um, Mr. Aaron Hickson's here from engineering. Um, he can follow up with you, but seriously, when you have an issue like that in the future, just call us and we'll, we'll help you get the answers you need. So thank you. Um, so now we will move, oh, Mayor's comments. Um, just a couple of events upcoming that I do want to remind you all love budget meetings are beginning tomorrow. I'm very excited by that. I love working on the budget as stressful as it is sometimes, but it's always exciting. Um, there's an off-the-clock business before hours with the chamber. It's happening on the 14th, which would be Thursday, and that's at HCI Supply. You can call the chamber for more information on that. Um, in case you haven't noticed, there's big tents at the fairground. I would tell you that that's for the Cirque d'Italia. Water Circus, I've been before. It's, it's it's someone who used to be in the circus. It's fun to watch because it's very similar to the aerial circus that I was in. And a lot of people, I bet, didn't know that. Um, um, this Friday is Good Morning Gallatin with Congressman John Rose. Budget meeting is continuing. Mr. Henschel's birthday is coming up on the 21st. Happy late birthday to you, Mr. Fan. I think it was yesterday. Um, community Enhancement Grant, that committee is going to meet all day on the 22nd of March. And then on the 23rd is Vice Mayor Love's birthday. Um, and then on the 29th is Richard Dupree's birthday and also Good Friday just before Easter. I um, do want to mention that um, Councilman Carter is hosting an Easter extravaganza at Clearview Park from 1 to 3 on the 30th. And he is taking donations of eggs and prizes for the Easter egg hunters. I, if you're done, I'm I am. Done. Okay. First of all, I want to say I've been to that circus myself, and it, it was fan, it was great. I mean, it, it's worthy of a Nashville show, so people should go to that. And I've been asked to tell everybody or remind you that the 13th annual chili cook-off at Charter Senior Living will be this Friday, and <clears throat> that begins at 11 until 1, and it's always a really good little. Uh, event where you go in and taste chilies and vote for your favorite and the money raised goes to the Alzheimer's Association so please keep that in mind. 11 to 1? Yes. Yeah. They usually send us a flyer and they have it this year so thank you so much for that. I guess I'm your flyer. Oh, yeah. Hey that works. You know what's going on. Sorry. Um, okay so we will consider that a wrap up of mayor's comments and move on to the agenda and the first item is a dangerous building, 518 Red River Road, um, um, request for a show cause hearing on a dangerous building, and for that is Mr. Stewart, our building official. Oh, no, it's not. Sorry. <laughs> I saw you here, and your name was on the agenda, and then I look up, and you're not there. So, Mr. Durflinger. Good afternoon, Council. Charles Durflinger with City of Gallatin Building Codes. Um, tonight, I bring for you um, a building located at 518 Red River Road. And the presentation is not as long as the packet that's in the, of information that's on your desk. So this should be re relatively short. Um, in February of 2023, a car drove through the residence located at 518 um, Red River Road. As you can see, it did substantial damage to the A and B side, as well as the foundation of the um, building. Um, 
As you can see, in March of 2023, according to Google Maps, um, substantial completion of the repairs have been made. On July 21st of 23, an electrical permit was requested on behalf to um, be able to allow electricity uh, for Galveston Electric to hook up electrical back to the building. For them to be able to do that, they require an inspection performed by us. Um, the building official received the application. Um, sorry. Prior to that, though, we had not received any permits or requests for inspections or anything at the property. Um, as you can see by here, our building code that the city adopted requires permits and inspections on construction and repairs. Um, the city of Gallatin also passed amendments in accordance with that um, made it unlawful for a person to fail to comply with the provisions of that code. And not only the city, but the state also has um, code requirements that it makes it unlawful to do the work also and identifies that failure to meet those requirements is a class B misdemeanor by state law. <coughs> the reason I bring these up is that, for example, in Waterbury, Connecticut, back in 2011, an individual converted a two family dwelling <coughs> into a four family dwelling without any permits or approval by the city which led to the death of a 32-year-old man <coughs> because of it. Um, the landowner was found guilty of second-degree manslaughter. As an inspector, if I willfully sign off on that, I'm accepting that responsibility. And that brings the responsibility also back onto the city. So back in um, July, whenever that permit was um, requested, Inspector Black, who had also responded out there whenever the initial incident happened, identified that hey, no permits had been done and he couldn't sign off on it. But he did offer the owner the opportunity to have a um, professional engineer do an inspection of it. And if he signed off on it, we would accept that on, in lieu of. Since then, we hadn't heard anything back from the land on, property owner. On February 2nd of this 2024, the building official Chuck Stewart received an email from a Neil Robertson, who's a professional engineer with R4 Engineering out of Lebanon, and he was um, retained by the property owner to do an inspection of the property. And this is what makes up the majority of the packet that's before you because he found significant foundation issues, termite damage, and wood rot during his ins inspection. And so this is some of the images that he provided us. You can see the piers underneath the building are sitting at five degrees to 20 degrees off at center. Significant rot. And termite damage. Also, you can notice in the roof how the roof is sagging and how it's missing um, on the corner post. It's missing uh, anchors to support stuff or support the members. And like I say, you can see additional termite damage from underneath the house. Even one of the floor joists has fallen off. And this is after the repairs have been made. You can see the slope of the um, front porch and the back end addition that had been applied to it are not in level. And then also you bring in the quality of the work of the repair that was made. If you look to the left, you'll see that the um, wall had received significant damage. Zooming in over top of the window, you can see where the crack or the seam is for the siding that was there in February. If you look at how the work looks today, that same piece of siding is still in the same position underneath new siding, which leads to question the quality of work that was performed on this property to bring it to where it is today. It is in the opinion of the building official who concurs with the um, architect or the um, professional engineer that this building is a dangerous building. And if repairs were to be made, they would need to be brought to current codes. 
and the cost effectiveness of that would probably outweigh the um, cost of the property value itself for the building and recommends demolition. So we are requesting a show cause hearing to be granted. Any questions? A heck of a report. Yeah, it's a, it's a mess. Yeah, it's good. <clears throat> good report. Second. You need to state what date. It has to be between 10 and 30 days from now. I would recommend April the 2nd April as the 2nd. hearing date. Thank you. It. I am so sorry, y'all. Um, I uh, um, have a motion by Councilman Hayes, a second by Vice Mayor Love, for a show cause hearing for 518 Red River Road to be held on April 2nd. So is there any conversation or discussion you desire? If not, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. Granted unanimously. Um, item number two is a dangerous building at 507 Carson Street. Um, Mr. Durflinger. Yes, first I'd like to thank everybody who got this put on tonight's agenda. Um, there was a little bit of a rush too, based off the location and condition of the building that we were wanting to get it boarded up. Thank you to those that assisted in that. Um, also the property owner, Mr. John Dow, he's here also. I'd like to get him to come up. So if there's any questions y'all like to present to him afterwards. But after last week's election, the building located 507 Carson Street, which is located directly across the Union School, was brought to the attention of the building official. An investigation of the property found that the structure was unsecured and in bad shape, with extensive damage, warped, and missing structural members, extensive rot and deterioration due to weather and exposure to in and insects, And like I said, it's also unsecured. And vegetation has encroached on the property, on the building itself. Um, the building official feels that this property is inherently dangerous and the rush to bring it before you tonight was to get it boarded up so that we could secure it and make it safe for the area since there was a school around it. Since then, um, Mr. Dow contacted me yesterday morning. He has boarded up the property. I looked at it this afternoon. Um, we are requesting a show cause hearing to determine that this building is a dangerous building. That being said, Mr. Dow does have plans in May to start doing either renovations or demolishing that property. And that's it. Any questions? This one's short. <laughs> uh, this is a... Uh, um say you make a motion along the same date that would then kind of start the clock for you mr dowell to either make the Sorry, repairs or <laughs> abolish uh, or demolish i would ask if there's any further comments that you want to make or since you're here we appreciate you being here the gentleman here has been very helpful to me today he came over a couple of times uh personally we purchased it for investment property but we had some more we were working on so him and i in our discussion we decided this interest is just to go ahead and demolish it. So with that being said, it would have to come back for a show calls here. Could probably start around May, the middle of May. We have a couple of projects we got going on. So we'd like yeah. to go ahead and do it. Well, we'll that. go ahead and do the show calls here and you don't necessarily have to be here since okay. you seem like you're on the path with us, but that will start the clock to give you some period of time determined by this body to either um, demolish it or rehab it. We do greatly appreciate you taking action when you were notified so shortly to board it up to protect the property. Thank you. I, I well, personally appreciate that and I know this board does too. So, entertain a motion from Ms. Park? I have a question first. Okay. <clears throat> do we still need to do a show cause notice? I, um, I think... With I them mean, being here and already having plans to take care of it? I think it would be my recommendation because um, that I think absolves the yes, city of liability. we are required liability. by law if you want to proceed gotcha. to require him to demolish or to take action on this. You're required by law to have to have a show cause hearing and to give proper notice. 
And I feel certain that he's going to take care of it, but Definitely. say some sure. circumstance happened and it wasn't done, this is how the city would then be able to take care of it after a period of time if it weren't done. So I think for the city to relieve itself <coughs> of any liability, that that would be the best action. Okay. Not an attorney. <laughs> I think Ms. Simon Colley concurs. I'll use a motion to send it on. Okay, motion by okay. Councilman Carter. Dash 17, it's a resolution allowing the mayor to sign Project Phoenix Memorandum of Understanding. And for that, Ms. Rosemary Bates, Interim Executive Director of our Economic Development Agency. Um, before we get into that, I do just want to offer some kind of framing of this. Um, I can tell you that many of us have had discussions over the years about, you know, how do you get redevelopment of the periphery of our historic downtown square spawned. Um, our historic downtown square is very robust and vibrant um, compared to where it was a decade ago. There have always been some businesses that thrived, but it was largely vacant not too many years ago. Now it is um, a very desirable destination for many. Um, I think several of our businesses there are doing quite well. Um, but if you talk to Main Street communities, if you talk to um, urban planners, if you, I mean, if you just listen to the conversations within our community, the proper way for us to be looking at develop is to develop from the core out. And around the, around our, you know, special square, we have a lot of properties that do have the opportunity for redevelopment should there be someone interested in taking that on. Because we are a community in a growth trajectory and because no one has taken on that kind of project at this point, understand that there's trepidation and risk and fear associated with what that might look like. We have, over the years, Mr. Fenton, I, Ms. Bates, we've had so many conversations with various developers about this property or that property or this property and what could possibly go there and could they acquire it and what does redevelopment look like. And um, it happens in community like, like communities like ours across the country. I've talked to developers who have done it in, you know, both in Alabama and up in, um, around, up in Maryland, and then some that have done it in, you know, Franklin and Columbia and some of these other areas that are closer to us. But we haven't had interest here in our community that's actually, you know, coming to a place to actually kind of look at it and see if it's a feasible um, prospect. Um, even our local developers, I've often said, why don't you do something with redevelopment around the square? But that's not what they do. It is a difficult ask of somebody because of the different type of project than building houses in a, you know, open pasture land, which is what I would like to see us get away from and accommodate the needs for housing, you know, in our urban core. But um, again, I understand the, the fear and the trepidation, but that's why we're where we are to now, to have this conversation, to look at the feasibility of it, and to talk more about it. There are several people this evening, but I'll start with Ms. Bates. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I'm just the beginning, there are three others uh, after me, so just be patient with us, okay? And there are some great questions asked by the public. Some of them will be answered tonight. Some of them can't be answered tonight because the nature of the agreement that we're asking you to allow the mayor to sign. Well, or we is, don't know the answers to. Is until. designed to reach a point where we can answer questions. Um, and at any point, the city can get out of this agreement and I will explain that a little bit more later. But one of the questions that I've seen is why does this have a name? At most any project that comes to our office has a code name. There are many, many reasons for that. And I'm happy to do a EDA 101 with anybody who wants to ask. Uh, Jeff Hinchel's done some great videos explaining it. But we were asked to keep this project confidential because as the mayor said, there have been other companies and developers that have looked at downtown, but this is the first one that's reached a point where it wanted to actually pursue feasibility to develop. Um, and using code names is standard practice in economic development. It's allowed by state law, so we're not violating any law or public records situation. Um, this property, where am I pointing this, Jenna, here? Here, and then hit the right arrow. Yep. Oh, well, there's the problem. <laughs> got it, got it, got it, got it. 
Thank you. Okay, the, we are talking about city-owned property and these two areas outlined in red. Uh, phase one, as uh, Boyle, uh, the developers are calling it, and does include City Hall, Fire Hall one, and the building that has been the chamber. Of course, they are moving out of that. Phase two would include the current police department headquarters and the farmer's market. It's approximately 6.2 acres. It does not include the downtown square. This is not on the square. It's down the street from the square. We are not mowing down the old courthouse that is soon to be vacant when those judges move into the new courthouse. Which is not the city's. That's correct. We don't own that building, and uh, that's... We don't have any decision-making authority to mow it down to begin with. Um, we did not spend any money on this project yet. Um, it is possible that we may, but we'll get into that with, uh, in regards to the MOU. This is the conceptual drawing provided by Boyle. It is conceptual. It does not mean it will end up looking like this. The hotel is shown in purple. City Hall is in blue. Parking's in gray, residential is in brown, and mixed use is with these hash marks, and it's hard to see here, but there's a little chart in the bottom left that talks about the hash marks. This shows you where the current city hall approximately sits, um, so you can understand where you are today and how it looks on this conceptual drawing. And I'm going to introduce uh, John Harlan with Boyle in a few minutes, and they're going to talk about who they are and a little more detail about their concept. All right, I'm going to jump into some financial information. I'm just going to hit the highlights because we have that expert here as well tonight. The taxes generated on City Hall Block are exactly zero dollars. This property, because it's owned by the city, generates no taxes. If developed, the, um, and as I said, Younger and Associates is here. They are a well-respected entity, hired independently. They don't work for... Yes, we hired them, but they don't work for us. It's not their job to make things look good for us, and it's not their job to make things look for, good for the developer. They are an independent analysis of this project. Um, construction, the one-time impact is nearly $262 million, and then more than $66 million annually is the impact from the hotel, commercial, and multifamily once it becomes operational. The property tax generated, again, that generates zero property taxes today. Annually, once it's operational, the property taxes are anticipated to be to the city, uh, nearly 489,000, to the county, 1.378 um, million. The total is 1.865 million. 20-year total on the life of this project, um, and this assumes that the assessments and everything stay the same, which they most likely will not, but the 20-year total for property taxes alone is more than $37 million. And again, most of that is going to go to the county. Other local taxes, the direct and indirect, um, are about $2 million annually. Uh, and then when you put all those taxes together, the property tax and the other indirect taxes is about four million annually this project will generate perpetual revenue and that's how you're going to pay for some of your expenses maybe all of them related to relocating city hall um, and down the road the police department i am taking the fire department a little bit out of this equation because you had already planned to address that i do understand i'm I understand that you have to pay for that as well, and it needs to be part of the discussion. The jobs created during construction is approximately $1,099, and after construction, the perpetual jobs for all of the development are anticipated to be 444 jobs. It brings in a built-in customer base right down the block for businesses, on the square and around the square. The multifamily and the hotel guests alone should bring at least 400 people who can walk out 
to the sidewalk and jump over to Phillies or uh, Star Ranch. I don't think it's Star Ranch anymore. I think it's Star something. But um, and have dinner, pick up ice cream, uh, a hazelnut croissant at the Guilty Grind, uh, or shop on the square, whatever the case may be. I, I would anticipate that business owners and property owners would see significant um, improvement to their bottom lines and their uh, property values. Now, a little bit about the MOU, and I am not an attorney, <laughs> and we do have one of the attorneys here who has worked on this project on our behalf. It allows Boyle to conduct due diligence, which is basically your survey, a phase one environmental, property inspections, the basic things that most developers do when they're looking to build on a piece of property. If Boyle decides we're not interested, it's not gonna work for us, we're done and the city is obligated to nothing. There's no money that the city is obligated. If Boyle and the city say, okay, it's proven to be feasible on both sides, and that due diligence needs to happen, both with the city and with Boyle, then the parties move forward to the next step, which is a project agreement, which is not being voted on or considered tonight. That's down the road. And there's still no cost to the city. Where the cost comes into the city if Boyle gets through its months of due diligence and then says, it's gonna work, we're ready, let's keep talking, and the city says, we've changed our mind, we're not interested, uh, things have happened, whatever the case may be, if we choose to back out at that point, then the most that we would be out is $65,000. That money is already in our budget, the EDA budget. And it could be less than that, um, but it will be no more than $65,000. Uh, the MOU doesn't determine final site plan, design, or property layout. It doesn't decide who builds the new city hall or the parking garage or compensation regarding the land, which was one of the questions. Um, there's never been a discussion about giving the land. They've never asked for the land to be free. They have never asked for a pilot or a tip. I'm not saying that might not come up down the road, but to this point, that has not been part of the discussion and there's been absolutely no agreement associated with that. And may I interject and say that they are well aware that financial feasibility is gonna be the city's big concern. As, as well as theirs, yeah, both sides. Financial is the big concern. Um, the city conveys the property to the Gallatin Industrial Development, Development Board if a future property agreement is executed. The IDB may not take any action without city approval. If the project does not move forward during the project <coughs> agreement phase, for whatever reason that may be, then the IDB conveys the property back to the city. At no time, just one more thing, at no time may the Gallatin IDB make decisions without the city's approval. That's been the discussion the entire way. The IDB is not interested in making decisions without the city's approval. By state law, it is a way to advance the project, and Mr. Trent will explain some of that. The city maintains control. Existing City Hall, why would we even look at doing something with City Hall? 2020, we did an assessment of the building and we did a extensive study of the space that was needed. It started right before COVID and it was completed during COVID. It's economically not feasible to retrofit the existing building. I'm not gonna mislead you and say that this building is in jeopardy of falling down. It's a block building with steel beams and brick on the outside. It's a pretty sturdy building, but it is ancient mechanically, electrically, plumbing. Uh, some of the equipment is already obsolete and we live day by day hoping it doesn't fail. There are things we have in the building that, that parts don't even exist for anymore. We've had a fabulous building maintenance supervisor, Linda Satterfield, who somehow through bailing wire and chewing gum, manages to miraculously fix a lot of things that have gone wrong in this building. And do not lose him. 
We need to keep him as long as you can. Um, okay, let me go back. One more thing to say. Um, we could retrofit the building uh, and spend a lot of money on all those things I just talked about. It might give you some use for another eight to 10 years. One of the bigger problems with this building is because of the way the load-bearing walls are, it's very hard to adjust it for the current needs of the departments that are in it and the staffing and to meet the needs of the public. In that 2020 study, we didn't move forward because COVID happened. We weren't sure what was gonna happen economically. And then a couple of years ago, people started asking about how could we do some redevelopment in your downtown? We didn't know at that time that the city hall block would be of interest, um, but we've been discussing that for many months now in terms of how do we get to the point where we even, Boyle is ready to say, we'd like to do this, may we have your permission? And that's what led us here tonight. Okay, fire hall number one, we've discussed it needs to move. Why would you tear down a fire hall? It can last forever. Well, it needs to move east for adequate coverage to ensure balanced fire and EMS response services throughout the city. Chief Beeman has a great map with these big rings that he puts down and you will completely understand it if you get that presentation. There is an infrastructure failure in the current facility, whether you do anything with Project Phoenix or not, our home number one's folks and equipment are probably gonna have to move out temporarily or permanently because of those failures. I'm not gonna go into what they are, but you would not wanna be in that building when it happens. <laughs> it will not smell good. Uh, the current building and storage are maxed out. There's no remaining options for expansion to house additional equipment or personnel. And you don't wanna spend more money on additional equipment if you cannot protect it and house it. Average service life of a fire station is 50 years. This has certainly served its purpose, but it is now too old, too obsolete, and not the right place, and not big enough. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Police department headquarters. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, uh, I said this once before about Chief Bandy, and he has, um, done a lot with a little and nothing new until we started building the gun range. He does not complain about that. I just know he's had to um, cram a lot of people into a very small space. He's gone from 29, or the police department's gone from 29 employees back when the building was open. They have 135 now. There's very limited space for staff and public um, public parking to visit the police department. Right now, GPD has seven separate facilities. <coughs> Some of them are for storage. Two of these contain asbestos. Additionally, the main administration building lacks sufficient windows, ventilation, fire suppression system, and ample security. Current location doesn't allow for adequate expansion. There's not enough property there to expand or add on to the building. You would have to do a lot of work in the current building and there's just not enough space to adequately expand. Thank you very much. Um, like City Hall, it's just economically not feasible to modify the existing building. You might add another several years of life to it, but then you're starting all over again. Okay, I'm pointing. And it's still on, and now the green light went off. So let's just stop here. Oh, no, we can, this is okay. But for the next person, it, it might not be bad to get the, okay. Um, as I told you, I have two, three other people ready to speak. Um, there was one other question that was brought up. Um, and, you know, I've read a lot and I've seen a lot about, oh, this will mean our taxes will go up. I can't speak for the county. Uh, when we met with Councilman Joe Vance, you know, he's concerned about the county raising their property tax rate. Yes, I know that affects people who live in the city of Gallatin. The city of Gallatin has not raised its property taxes in more than 18 years. 
You cannot blame the city for the county raising its property taxes. You can argue schools, but the city provides 40% of the revenue to the county and only 23% of the population lives here. The city subsidizes the rest of the county. Maybe it says other communities should do more of their part and their share. And I'm not making that as a political statement. That's not my point. People often confuse a county property tax raise with a city property tax raise. They think that the city spent its money and built the new courthouse. We had nothing to do with that. They think that the city is building the parking garage. We're not building that parking garage. Um, we contributed some funding to it, but we're not building it. Um, and there are a lot of misconceptions because people just don't understand the separation <coughs> between the county and the city and who makes decisions, and particularly with the school system. The city has no authority to demand or uh, direct the city school, the Sumner County Schools, what to do. Uh, we, don't, we, do we have a county-wide school system, and our money goes just as like everybody else's money. Um, so what I would like to do next is introduce you to John Harlan, and he is with Boyle, and he has his own presentation, and I don't know what we need to do about this. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, one of the gentlemen who has been meeting with us and brought this project to James Fenton, his name is Jeff um, Haynes. And there's also been some comments, why did these Nashville people come in and do something to our city? Jeff Haynes' family has deep roots in Sumner County. His mom and dad, he remembers coming up here. Uh, they, I remember, um, <laughs> I remember sitting in my office not long after I'd moved into economic development, and his mom, Barbara Haynes, who was a judge, and his dad was a state senator, because she said, oh, I just love your farmer's market. Every weekend we'd come up and we stop at the farmer's market, and then we go out to our place, and we just love it, and, and thank you for what you're doing in Gallatin. So he has great passion for this community. If it were another community, I don't think that Boyle would be looking there. I think in part why they're looking at Gallatin is because his history and his connection to this community. He's got relatives in this community. He's sorry he couldn't be here tonight. He hopes to be here next Tuesday night, assuming you pass this on for a vote next Tuesday. So, John, I'm going to turn it up. Thank you. John Harlan with Boyle. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, I want to thank Rosemary um, and also uh, thank Mayor Brown and the council just for giving us some time and appreciate just the opportunity to take a look at this project. And again, as we've mentioned before, this is just for us to uh, you know, broach feasibility of something for us to pursue. As she mentioned, Boyle Investment Company, who I work with, um, was founded by um, the Boyle family in Memphis, and it's a 90-year-old company. Um, our Nashville office was founded in 2001. She mentioned Jeff Haynes, who's a founding partner of ours. It was started by Jeff Haynes and Phil Fawcett in 2001, and since then we've grown that to over 4 million square feet of uh, being an owner-operator and developer of primarily mixed-use commercial product. As she did mention, Jeff um, graduated from Vanderbilt, grew up in uh, Gillettsville. His parents uh, had a farm. His dad was born and raised in Castilian Springs, so we've been out to their old family farm where they've restored the farmhouse uh, numerous times from, for you know retreats and workshops for work. Um, he's very close and tied in with still people within this community, and that's how that you know came to us to have an, an interest. What I want to try to just accomplish, you know, briefly as I can is just to give a general overview to the council and those here today um, about Boyle um, and just focus in on here's projects that we've done, how that maybe can fit with the context of what we're gonna potentially try to accomplish uh, over the next six months to 12 months. Uh, as mentioned, it was founded in uh, 1933. We celebrated our 90th year uh, last year as an operating and investment company. Um, we invest on behalf of the Boyle family um, who is now in their third generation of uh, leadership out of our Memphis office. Um, one high-level comment related to the Boyles, they're a long-term owner and operator, which is a little bit different and unique in our sphere of influence within commercial real estate. So you can hear of a long-term owner and operator versus what we would call a merchant developer. Um, the Boyles like to hold assets for a long time. That gives us a little bit more flexibility, honestly, to. Uh, and working for somebody like that because we're allowed to be a little bit more 
potentially thoughtful wood development without having some sale horizon or investment horizon that we have to meet. Um, we do everything from development to the ground up to manage and lease our own properties. Uh, I will clarify that our multifamily assets that we do own, we do not, at this point, we have not managed those ourselves. We've had third party management uh, companies do that for us. Um, really for us, one of our vision statements is establishing our, our identity as community builders, uh, where we do work. Um, I'm gonna go through a handful of different projects that we've done that have been listed and we primarily focus most of our projects in Williamson County, uh, Davidson County, and then potentially if this, we did move forward, this will be our first project in Sumner County. The first project I'd like to just show from a contextual standpoint is really our, um, our biggest urban infill development that we have done to date out of our Nashville office. This is our Capital B project, which if any of you all are familiar, this is located just west of the state capitol on Charlotte Pike down the hill right, right before you get to I-65. Um, we were approached by a larger partner of ours, probably this is more than 10 years ago, just about managing this area at the time. And then we're able to convince HCA to relocate their corporate headquarters there. Um, and then we planned a mixed use development in and around that with one of our uh, other partners, capital partners. Um, it's been wildly successful. We had um, Publix put their first kind of urban footprint grocer there. Um, that's just under 30,000 square feet and then have been able to combine a mix of uses with uh, apartments, uh, a hotel uh, pad. We did Lifeway uh, corporate headquarters was relocated there and we did a development services for them to put their corporate headquarters there. Unfortunately, they're no longer in that building. Um, and then we've held on to two other assets, the apartments and then an office building that we lease and manage ourselves. This is a before picture. Um, just to give you an idea from this development standpoint, um, it's crazy to look at Nashville, you know, again at this time and how much has changed. Uh, I think to that point is, that was mentioned earlier, just how much the growth within this area, um, you know, the broader region and the radius uh, around Nashville has been dramatic over the last 15 years. So there's the before picture. Here's the after. And this has all been constructed to date. Um, our next project that I'd love to just kind of highlight is a little bit of a different uh, sampling. This is called Berry Farms, um, which if you go all the way south on 65, right before you hit 840, um, this is located in South Franklin and is a 600, plan, 600 acre plan, uh, mixed use and master plan community. Uh, we're partners with the Berry family on this. So a long-term ownership partner uh, and land JV partner with the Berry family. Um, this again has kind of been what we've we've tried to do with most of our developments is provide a mixture of uses for a community and have those all you know all, all show, ships rise excuse me uh, related to different asset classes and product types this again is a before photo this was probably taken in 2010 just to give you perspective um, as we're doing kind of phase one grading for some residential development during a really difficult economic time um, and some retail development there in the front. Here's a current picture today. This is just the phase one, which we call town center. Um, if you look here kind of to the bottom of the, of the slide, this is more of kind of a town, what we call a retail district um, with retail shops and then some uh, mix of uses with some townhomes and apartments. Uh, as you kind of go toward the top of the screen and then residential all to the left, all the way back around the right corner. Uh, a project that we're currently working on today uh, is called McEwen Northside. Um, this is 45 acre development that's located just off of the McEwen uh, exit in Cool Springs, right across from the Whole Foods Center there on the west side of the interstate. Again, contextually, this is something a little bit different. Um, is, is anybody that's aware with Cool Springs uh, and what's already been developed and built there within Franklin? Um, it is a you know thriving commercial district. Um, we're currently under construction on a 240,000 square foot office building today as we speak, um, which is very counter to where the real estate market is today. But have been you know fortunate to be able to release this project. Um, it also includes a foray for us again into mixed use with a hotel pad, um, potential condo building that we have entitlements for. Um, a hotel, over 300 key hotel, and as well as uh, more apartments. 
Again, here's a before photo. This was probably taken in 20, uh, 2018. And then here's currently today. This is not all built today. Um, everything pretty much on the right side of the screen has been completed and built. The tower on the top left is currently under construction. And then this last is the last phase of multifamily that, we're, that we'll hopefully complete here in the next two years. Last project, just to highlight um, kind of a different concept of what we've done is a project we did in Brentwood, right off of Franklin Road in Maryland Way called City Park Brentwood. If anybody's familiar with that area, there was the old Moreland Mansion, which you can see still stands with the hotel in behind it in this photo. Um, this was a old Coger business center that was built in the mid 1980s. Most of the office buildings were built between 1985 and 1995. Uh, we were fortunate enough to buy the center and then rezone and, and drop in some inline retail, about 40,000 square feet, and then carve off a hotel pad and sell that and then wrap the hotel um, to try to complement the existing structure there for the, uh, for the Moreland House and the old Moreland Farm. That's what it will look like before. And then we completed this in 2015, and that's what it looks like today. Um, I know we've had a lot of questions related to the project. Um, again, there's not really much that I could potentially elaborate more on at this point besides this just being conceptual. Um, I will say that, you know, part of the idea, and it's it's mentioned in the MOU, is that this, you know, the hotel will potentially be over 100 key hotels, so beyond 100 rooms. Um, the apartment units would be anywhere in between no less than 150 units, but no more than 300 units. And then what's provided for the mixed uses, more than likely, this would, uh, we would envision this to be ground floor retail to try to activate the street on Franklin Street. But again, at this time, this is just more conceptual. Again, these are just some precedent image examples. This is uh, kind of our town center at Berry Farms. To give you an idea there, those are all apartment units that are on the second and third level of that brick building. And as you wrap around the corner on this other side of the retail on the ground floor and park space. Um, and lastly, I grew up, I've, I've worked for Boyle, I uh, actually started in December of 2008, a fantastic time to uh, get in the real estate business. Um, I grew up in Franklin, Tennessee, so I think anybody that's familiar with Franklin has seen how dramatically downtown Franklin has changed over the last 30 years. Um, these are precedent images from a project uh, called Harper Square, where they built, we did not develop this, just another local developer did an excellent job with this project as far as execution. Um, executed a hotel, 150 room hotel, and then 200 plus apartments, um, right as you drive into downtown Franklin, coming in off of Franklin Road. Um, I do not have more to add related to this current project. All I will just uh, confirm and say is that we're excited to pursue this opportunity uh, if approved. Um, as I mentioned, Jeff Haynes has really been the driving force in our office um, related to the ultimate, you know, the, the initial due diligence phase in this. Um, and we certainly hold the same thing in mind of the boils that it would need to be, you know, viable and feasible for us to, to move forward. And that's really just the next step for us. So I thank you very much for your time. And um, I'll step aside unless there's more questions. Thank you. And Corey's going to hang with us. He's not abandoning us in case y'all have questions. Um, next, I would like to introduce, John is going to hang with us. And the next person is Corey Van Blericom. Come on up, Corey. And I believe, Corey, you said that's Dutch? It's Dutch. Dutch. So I learned something new. Yeah, I was like, oh, how do you say your last name? I don't want to mess this up. He is with Younger and Associates. And again, they're an independent financial uh, analysis organization that has done a financial impact assessment for this project. And he does not have a PowerPoint or anything, so if you want to do whatever you need to do, John. Good evening. Uh, Rosemary introduced me. My name is Corey Van Blaircom uh, on the research team with Younger Associates. And um, my wife is actually from Gallatin. She's, she came along with me on the, on the trip today, visiting with some family and friends. So Rosemary hit the high notes of the report in, in her presentation, uh, the key numbers. So we don't have to go through line by line what the report says. But really, 
There's a written narrative and calculation tables that back up the numbers that she said. And like she mentioned, we're an independent company, a firm based in, in Jackson and Memphis, Tennessee. And so oops, we've done projects all across the state similar to these and, and, and smaller and bigger. And um, we, we design our reports to be conservative in, in design uh, on purpose. We keep our dollars uh, constant. We don't factor in inflation. Um, so a lot of the numbers, even though they look well or they look good, they can even improve with you know, the, the economy improving or property taxes going up or, or you know, whatever the you know, wage, wage inflation, all those things can, can improve the sales tax and um, property taxes that are generated by the project. But if you want to hit some high notes, really, I'm here to answer questions more than anything. Rosemary hit the high notes, the written, the written portion of the report, in the first few pages, you can see it explains our methodology, um, what we use to, to generate the, the impact numbers is, is the RIMS-2 multipliers from the BEA. Um, it's typically used to, or it was originally used to measure the impacts in, uh, of military bases, airports, and their, their impacts in communities locally, and um, has since been now used to, to measure the impacts of, of different industries throughout the counties at the county level. And so that's what this report does. And so we measure the one-time impact of construction, what that capital investment generates in impact dollars. And, and impact is essentially um, $1 of economic impact represents a $1 flowing through the local economy of, at the county level and city level. So Sumner County and Gallatin. And so 155 million will be invested potentially in this project, which generates a phase one impact of 261, oh sorry, that's the total, $261 million impact with $2.4 million in local taxes generated during construction. Important to note that those jobs are transient, that they're not permanent as, <coughs> as is normal with construction. Oftentimes those jobs don't stay once the project is complete. The operation impact, though, that is something that can continue long term. And we've measured a 20 year period. Um, that was just with the, the scope that we chose or what was given to us to, to measure. And so you can see that those 444 jobs are retained jobs over that course of time at full operation. These things can vary, but this is an annual impact and then a 20 year total. Two phases of the project annually impact. The, in, the annual economic impact looks like 66 million with 444 jobs, 16 million in wages, local taxes, local sales tax of almost a million, indirect taxes, which would be realty, motor vehicle, liquor tax, things that are local taxes but aren't as, are just concrete as the sales tax, and then property taxes. Those are generated by the wages and jobs as well. The, those who would live here and work here, what their property taxes would be based on the, the existence of this project and its impact in Gallatin. And so, again, Rosemary did a great job hitting the high notes of the report. If there's something that any of you have a question about, I'd love to answer. It would take a long time to go line by line through the report, and I don't want to bore everybody even more. So, Rosemary, I appreciate it. But, and uh, again, if there's any questions, if, you, if there's something that stands out and you want some clarity on it, I'd love to help. Uh, but again, thank you very much for your time. And uh, okay. that's all I got. Thank you. No, thank you. And he too is going to hang with us. He drove here from Jackson, right? I'm actually from Memphis. Oh, but you drove here? I have an office in Jackson. Okay. So I drove from Memphis. All right. So. And next, I want to introduce you to Tom Trent. He's with the Bradley Law Firm, and he has worked on this project on our behalf. He's worked closely with Susan, and he is looking at this MOU for us. He does not work for Boyle, he works for us. So he's just going to give you a few more details about the MOU. And he's an attorney and I'm not, so he really knows what he's doing. Good evening, everybody. I'm Tom Trent. Um, just a couple things. Uh, I appreciate these meetings and the public comments in the beginning. I I'll remind everybody, Ben Franklin once said, don't believe everything you read on the internet, right? The, and, and the Business Journal appears to have gotten ahead of itself with that headline. <laughs> I didn't read that article, but this MOU is not designed to commit you to build the project. So that's just, everybody needs to understand. 
What this really is about is simply giving you the opportunity to find out whether Boyle can pull together a business deal that you want to do. It's that simple. <laughs> Your commitment, and I'm going to walk you through just some of the things that, that if I were you, I'd want to know. Number one, what about these Boyle people? I will tell you personally, I worked on the CHS headquarters deal with them and Meridian and Carruthers and Franklin. I worked with them on the Health Stream headquarters deal in the North Gulch, and we represent the Berry family at Berry Farm. I've been on the other side of them for how long have Jeff and uh, 20, 20, plus years. 20 plus years? And uh, I'm impressed that the city came up with them as an opportunity. They're people that I, I would trust, just so you'll know that. Um, number two, the younger report, I always, I actually spoke at a seminar this morning where they were on the panel with me in Jackson, and uh, they were teasing me because I always say, the one thing I know about all the reports that you get about feasibility are that it's not going to be exactly that. It's, it's, it's estimates, and it's based on really great economic theory, but what will happen is your inflation rate will kick in, and it will be better than the numbers they show because they don't take any inflation into account in their reports. So I would suggest when you read that, keep in mind when inflation gets involved, it's likely to be better. Okay? Now, as to the MOU, simply, if you track with me for just a couple minutes, because I do like to point out the words, this is a portion of the property, not all of it because you need to keep property for City Hall, right? So it'll be worked out as to exactly where will everything fit, and it's to give the opportunity for the excess property you don't need after you conclude what you need to keep to put into a multi-use uh, development that creates a live, work, play environment. And the live, work, play is what you're seeing there. We're doing these all over the state right now where you, the live is get some people living downtown, apartments and condos. The work is there's offices there. And a lot of you and, and the people that you hire that work for the city will work here, among others, potentially. And the play is there's going to be retail on the ground floor, anticipated. So it creates a vibrancy, and it develops the property into a, a more dense use, which creates more property tax. So that's the basic theory, and you're going to have to decide whether you want to do that. And to decide, number one, the first step that will happen is they want to do a survey of the property. So they know exactly what they've got, so they can kind of figure out where everything will fit and if it works for you. Within the first 30 days, if you look here at paragraph 3B, these milestones means the steps involved. Paragraph B says they're going to propose a budget with you for this. I have to bring it back to you. It's a pursuit budget. And within 30 days, you guys work that out, or you have to extend that if you don't get done. But nothing, you don't have anything to deal with other than the survey until you've approved a pursuit budget. If you approve that, and then everybody moves forward, and it ends up that you pull the plug or they pull the plug, you guys are going to split the cost of, the, of what they've spent to date, capped, your, your part's capped at $50,000. So even if they spend 200000 the most you'd be out at that point is fifty. But they have to bring that back to you for your final approval, and you want to see the whole budget because they don't have it yet. They, they wanted to know you want to do at least these steps with them. Make sense? So once you have that pursuit budget, they're going to start spending money, and they have an inspection period for six months from the date the MOU signed. As Rosemary said, that's just for their due diligence, and that's to figure out whether they've got asbestos to deal with and things that will increase the cost beyond what they anticipated. If everybody pulls the plug, what's your maximum exposure? $50,000, right? Within six months, they also have to come up with a hotel brand that they get you to approve, because part of the deal is to get a good downtown hotel. If they can't do that, what happens? You can pull a plug. And what's the most exposure you have? $50,000.
Within 11 months, they have to have worked with the city to design what they want to propose for everything. But before they're going to want to do that, that's, that's going to be really expensive because they have to get architects and engineers and everything going. They want to have a project agreement in place. You're a party to that, the IDB's a party to that, and they're a party to that. That's going to be the document that really sets everything forth. And so you're going to end up with at least a five-month period there where they know they've got the opportunity to go forward if you approve the design. And they go working on that design, and they bring that back to you. They're going to probably be spending a lot more than $100,000 by then. But how much are you capped at? $50,000. So at the end of the day, your risk here is you're going to split the cost of a survey, and you're going to, at the end of the day, approve a budget for the pre-development costs. If you approve that, at that point, you start being responsible for half of what they spend to the date that the deal dies. But if it goes forward, you will have an opportunity at each of these steps to prove the deal, because it's, it's your building. It's your, it's your property, it's your site, and you got to know you can get your, your city hall done. you got to know where you put a fire station. you got to work all those details out. None of that is committed yet. It's just to find out whether this is going to be feasible. Does that help? <laughs> it's exciting. Uh, this is the kind of thing I really enjoy coming to town and helping with. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. And, and I think I want to add, Rosemary touched on this, and you did as well. I mean, the whole idea in some kind of redevelopment like this is to generate a revenue stream so that the burden doesn't fall on our taxpayers. Um, Gallatin has done a great job. You said 18 years of not raising our property taxes. That's because we have a very diverse revenue stream. We have money coming in from our residences, of course, on the property tax. You have money coming in, very importantly, um, from our um, commercial and industry. And that is a place that Gallatin actually really shines. I, uh, she mentioned the 40% of all the revenue to the county. I think it's actually a bit more than that. But the city of Gallatin brings in 43% of all of the personal property assessments in Sumner County versus Hendersonville, who brings in 26%. I would have never thought then, that. I know. And that, now, personal property, remember, is what you have inside your building. When you look at the industrial and commercial real estate property taxes, which, remember, that's a higher assessment, 42% comes from the city of Gallatin and 42% comes from Hendersonville, which you wouldn't think we'd be even, but it's because we have the industrial and the manufacturing that really is expensive. And then just to kind of put it in context, Gallatin represents about... Um, I don't think I brought that number with me. Um, yeah, we represent 30% of the sales tax. Hendersonville represents 40% of the sales tax. So that's 70% for the whole county. And see, in Gallatin, I can remember, the and, and Ms. Nichols and Rosemary, you'll remember it too, the first year our sales, I mean, the first month that our sales tax went over a million dollars. And then the first year that our sales tax overtook property tax as our primary revenue generator. And so this is just another one of those ways that we can help diversify revenue, support our square in a meaningful way that will be, you know, perpetual because you will have customers um, right there at your front door. Um, I think one of the things that and I'm fortunate, I get to live close to downtown, but one of the number one things that I hear from people is, Why are, you know, I want to live downtown. What's available to rent downtown? And there's not much right now. Or what's there available to buy near downtown? And there's not much. Um, so I think this gives that opportunity for people to, um, you know, have that downtown living experience in a small town around an historic square that's so appealing to a lot of people of all generations. Um, this is something anecdotally, I guess it's okay to share, but in our conversations with Boyle, they were talking about the multifamily that they envision for um, what would be adjacent to our downtown square would actually be some of the most expensive multifamily rent in the entire city of Gallatin. Yeah. So it's that it's, means lots of disposable income when they're shopping and eating downtown. Yeah, yeah, that translates into come, people who people can come really go. support downtown. Um, so now we can open the floor for questions. I see, Mr. and again, they're all available to answer questions. That financial assessment, it's a lot to digest, and some of it, when Lily Beth and I were looking at it, are like, 
well, it doesn't add up this way, but oh, you have to kind of go here and up down. Oh, I get it now. So and, be and, careful, don't think And that, that actually does remind me of something that I want to be really clear on, <coughs> because our efforts really are to be transparent, and bringing it to this meeting is how you do that. There was nothing, you know, going on that we could talk about until we got to this point. Um, but um, I think you made the statement, Ms. Mates, early on that um, we haven't spent any money on this, but clearly some money was spent through the Economic Development Agency, which is money that is routinely spent to assess whether projects make sense for the city of Galton to move forward with. So obviously, Mr. There, Trent, that, that is, is a minimal. Very yeah, minimal. Mr. Trent is not working for free, nor is Young <laughs> Associates. So I want to just be clear on that. We have not paid Boyle anything IDB's, to do. That's not how it works. So. Uh, oh, and IDB is paying Mr. Trent to be clear. So I want to make sure that we are clear on that. Mr. Finnell, you wish to be recognized. I think it's smart to explore our opportunities here. Um, I think it was about a year ago that I think most of the council, we traveled to Franklin to see that development down there. And then once I seen that concept, I realized the vision and what they're after here. My only, my only question is, I would say that um, Bull sees that it's worth the investment of spending in our downtown area. So if he's, he's willing to spend or explore that opportunity, then I think he knows that the customer base will be here. Right now we're sitting a little under 50,000. I think that's correct on our uh, census. Maybe a wee over. We don't really have an exact census. Right, versus Hendersonville. That would be my only question is they're banking on that the downtown could um, uh, pay off their investment for down here in this area. Um, that I, I see that the that, uh, that the apartments, I see that the condos, I see all that stuff would be thriving down here. Hotel, motel, um, that's something I'm sitting there just trying to vision right here on the square. Um, and certainly, I guess it would work because if they're spending that much money to look in this area, then they see a, a need and a desire for it. But um, I think it's an opportunity that we can look at and, and see what opportunities that, that we have available. Thank you for mentioning Harpers Square and also, John, that apartment in Harpers Square. And if anybody in the audience gets a chance to go and look at that project, it is, it is one of the inspirations for this from our office's standpoint. They have very little uh, turnover. Some people, a good number of people who live in those apartments are in the 55-ish and older community like me, um, and they will rent an apartment for themselves, and then they will rent an adjacent or another apartment in the building for their family to come stay in or friends who come and visit. Um, it's become a really um, unique community for how they use that. They even have pickleball on one level of the parking garage, which to me, I still do not understand that phenomenon, but I know people love it. Well, I think one of the cool things about Harper Square that I don't think we've mentioned this really at all, either relevant to Gallatin's potential development or that one that we're comparing to in Franklin, the parking garage is actually built interior, so you don't even see the parking garage. And for the people that are living in, like, the apartments, their parking is on the level where their apartment is, which I don't know how they can figure all that, but it was really amazing. But did they not say either when you and I visited or later, did they not say to us that they have a waiting list for apartments? Yes, yes. Which I was just like, are you kidding me? Because, I mean, they're very, very, very expensive apartments. But also the courtyard is absolutely amazing. Yeah, so on both sides, the courtyard on the mm -hmm. hotel side and on the apartment side. What other questions? I mean, while these folks are here, I don't know that they'll all be back next Tuesday night. Really, please, now's your time. And Vice Mayor Love, you recognize? I think, Rosemary, you, you may have already answered this a minute ago, but I'm not sure. So we are only capped at $50,000 if we choose not to go through it. If Boyle chooses not to go through after their study, do we owe anything? We don't owe. If they, if they bail yes, out... Yes, yes. I thought if they bailed out, we didn't After know. After you approve the pre-development budget, then if it's canceled, you split it with Boyle. Your cap is 50. 50. Even and if the they choose. And, and the reason why is that, 
What they don't want is for you to have another developer from Watkins. Could you use the microphone just for the benefit of the yeah. audience and those listening at home? Okay. And it, and it, it's, it's maybe a little more than 50 because the survey is a separate element. That's why I had 65000 in mind. Yeah, that's the max. The survey shouldn't cost $30,000. $65,000 is a lot to all of us as or most of us as individuals, but it wouldn't be that different in cost for a city that we would use to evaluate City Hall or that we would use to evaluate several engineering projects that happen within the city. Um, it's a good deal. Um, we went, when, when, sorry, I want to make sure that's on. Uh, the one in Franklin that we saw was very well done, very nice. It was, it's not going to be anything, I don't think, if we did go ahead with this, that wouldn't be a part of our downtown area that would hopefully, with, our, uh, with us being in control of how it looks, we can keep it with the historic look of our square and not put anything modern. And I like that. Um, this was a really nice development. I mean, it was very nice, and I feel like it will bring more people to the businesses that we already have and encourage other people to open more businesses. And of course, we all know that people uh, that live here want more and more amenities, and they want more places to go, and that this would attract that from what we saw when we visited Franklin. Um, so. My, uh, and it's well known that I am not a fan of high density out in our countryside. This brings it all downtown, and I think that's the goal for a lot of communities now, is to have a walkable community and have things downtown. It helps the businesses, like I said. Um, the only thing I'm not crazy about, is, and it's not even part of this, is having the fire station not or the police in the police station, not downtown. It's, it's it's been there forever, and I just feel like it should. We should at least have some kind of headquarters downtown for our fire and for our police. But um, that's my only concern right there with that. And well, and again, just for transparency and full information. Um, sake, I do want to say that field trips to Franklin were taken with nothing related to this project. Just to kind of show right. different people who were interested, different, um, um, you know, downtown redevelopment projects. Right. It was um, never mentioned to yeah, us that we might. Yeah. Be and I think Linda and I went at the same time, but I've been other times as well. Um, to your point, um, Councilwoman Love, this doesn't require annexation. It's not a farm, it's not a pasture, it's not a soybean field, it's not a sunflower field. It basically, it is a brown field. And once the fire station moves, it's, it's vacant. And I believe too that the parking area is open to the public as but, well. Is that uh, There has right? been so many discussions that. that whatever parking garage is built has to accommodate city hall um, and public parking and their residents. So again, those are all details that have to be worked out, but that's been made very abundantly clear in the and conversation. I, I think important relevant background information too is that there was a plan, somebody here that with this, was with the city at this point, Mr. Brown, I bet you would know. There was a plan at one point that actually put an expansion of City Hall basically out in the parking lot and built a parking garage in that parking lot. And in fact, when the county was moving forward with building the parking garage, I kept trying to say, what about the city hall parking lot? What about the city hall parking lot? Because at that time, they were talking about putting it down on Smith Street, and I wanted it close to the square for the benefit of the square merchants and restaurants. But um, they ultimately wound up over on Franklin Street. You know, one thing thinking about is, is, is it's been challenging for us with the parking in downtown Gallatin with the courthouse going on, but now that they're about wrapping that up, and finishing our parking garage. My question is, if this was ever to launch right there, would it be a lot easier on us now if we had workers coming in that we'd have a parking garage? Well, I don't know. I think if I were a downtown business, I would be very uncomfortable with how this kind of development could impact them. Um, I would hope that it could be much like the courthouse construction and keep the construction 
isolated to this property, but um, they would have some displaced parking. But that is something that we've had conversations about and well aware, are well aware of those concerns because they're real. But say there was a scenario in which City Hall went away, that means none of the city employees or vehicles would be down here. The courthouse employees who are now parking on the square and over here, they'd be parking in the garage and in the county building. Um, so I actually think that this period of assessment, this period of time of assessment is going to help us get a better sense of how the parking garage affects existing property. But taking down that parking garage is a very real concern that has to be addressed, in my opinion, um, as we move forward. I think we would have to identify some parking alternatives. And they mentioned that part of their due diligence is a parking study. He, Mr. F uh, Councilman Fans had his hand I'm so up. sorry. Well, uh, I keep looking this direction because y'all are there. One of, the, one of the advantages that I see here, <clears throat> our square now is an occasional destination. This is going to make our square a destination year-round. People are going to come to eat. My understanding, we're going to have a restaurant, maybe a rooftop. Uh, well, <laughs> we have what encouraged them uh, when we get to the design phase that you would have to approve that there is a rooftop amenity, yes. Yeah, that was one of the main. If this is as good as it sounds, we'll become a destination and we'll be bringing people out of town to spend money. Oh, sure, for the hotels alone. And they'll be using, they'll be eating and shopping and leaving. And there, and, and you know, there are so many conversations that we have all the time with economic development and me in my role, some of you in your roles, and, and you know, some of them are just kind of pie in the sky, yap, yap, yap dreams. But we've had some really exciting conversations lately with some people that are looking to bring some amenities to our community that are just fascinating well, and amazing to me. 20 years ago, who would have thought we would have been in this conversation? I remember the days on the square, there was absolutely nobody on the square. Well, and I, 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 I spoke to a group recently, and I said, well, I said what I've said before, which, and by the way, there is a forum on growth at MTSU. This Friday, if anyone would like to attend, apparently I'm part of the panel, happy to do so. But um, there is, um, you know, a perpetual disconnect that's always going to exist between elected bodies and citizens because no one wants anything built next to them and because things aren't built like they were 50, 40, 30, even 20 years ago. But here in our community, I also think that there is a challenge because several of us who have been around here for a minute we remember the times when businesses struggled to, um, struggled honestly to survive and to thrive was um, a really different challenge. Um, I said for a long time, I can remember sitting in rooms and saying, how can we attract investment in Gallatin? Because it was heartbreaking to see business after business after business, you know, some, some person spend their life savings to invest in their dream and they opened a business, and six months later, it shuttered. And that was a realistic experience for way too many people 15 and 20 years ago. And, and My first year with the city was the year we got ready to do the downtown revitalization project that we had a grant for. And it literally, this will not do, this project will not do this, but it literally, literally tore up the downtown square from building facade to building facade. It was the end of the world. Downtown was going to die. No one would ever come back. But to your point, it was a lot of law offices, rundown buildings, empty buildings that had been empty for a long time. We got through that. I've had many people yell at me, and I have a thick skin, and Nathan Harsh would the late Nathan Harsh would track me down, and he'd yell at me, and he'd say, this is awful, and this is terrible, and you're doing a horrible thing. And then once it began to come back together and he could see what it was going to look like, lo and behold, shock to the system, Rosemary, I think this is going to be good. I'm glad we did it. And I'm like, oh, Lord, Nathan, uh, thank you and, for and yelling I mean, at me all and, these months. And, and we're not being honest if we didn't say that probably did help close some businesses. And that's very, very sad. And certainly I would never want this project to have that kind of impact. That's what, not One thing it. that um, Councilman Joe Bonds brought up when uh, we met with him Monday is one of my passion areas, and that's South Water. Um, the difference between here and South Water is there's very little property on South Water I, I know one piece that the city owns, and it's not big enough to redevelop and create that 
um, domino effect down Southwater. There is a woman bringing in a project that's very exciting, and she chose Gallatin because of a meeting we had more than a year ago about attainable housing. Um, but So there are other areas to consider, but this is city-owned property, and we can help make it happen. We can't make a private property owner develop their property to look a better or nicer way. Or sell it. We want it yeah. or sell it. Or invest in it. I mean, we have had several conversations with people about Southwater, too, so I think we will see reinvestment, and, of course, we are reinvesting in the corridor. You were waiting to be recognized. Okay. Mr. Chavon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I kind of... I'm... You mentioned soft water, so I, I kind of disagree with the fact that we can't. We, I lived in a city where actually uh, the city government decided to revitalize private property and put enough incentive for people to do it, and that, that, that became a great start. But um, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm not against redeveloping the downtown, but Again, that need to make sense on the community, community side and financial side. So um, thanks for bringing that, but I, I didn't look at it. I'm going to have to look at it. Um, I went through, through the MOU, and I have the same question that got asked. Uh, why the MOU start by uh, the city conveying the land to the IDB? I can answer that. It doesn't yes, say please. we're conveying anything. It says we are considering conveying. Okay. There is no conveyance at this point of the project. At this point, we are not conveying any property. But if we do, why? That's a different project. That's be, be under the project agreement. Okay. And I think the answer that Ms. Bates gave is that you can develop... Um, well, actually, more efficient. Give me a good we'll Mr. Let, Trent question. We'll let Mr. Trent, who represents the IDB, he represents so IDBs across the state and is, has a wealth of knowledge there. The oh, short answer is that the Industrial Development Corporation Act has language in it that says that a city or county, it's defined as a municipality, may convey land or, or its property to an industrial development board and then it can use it with, for economic development purposes. What that does is it enables you to do that and not have to, and, and so a, a developer can then do this type of project much more quickly, cheaper, doesn't have to go through all the other rules and requirements the governments have to go through, and it works everything faster, better, cheaper. So almost every project like this that you'll see will go through an industrial development board. Sometimes Nashville has used their MDHA for that. That's how they built the Bridgestone Arena. But typically, you'll see an uh, IDB now, because that was added to the industrial development board statute a number of years ago to give you that flexibility. Importantly, nobody's suggesting that that happen now. That will be only when you end up with a project agreement that you've approved, because you've got a deal you want to do, OK? And, Mr. Trent, is it fair to say that when that project agreement is developed, whatever stronger language or yeah. you can put it in there multiple times if you want to, if that's your concern, that the IDB cannot make decisions without consultation with the city and yes. at the end of whatever it, it ends and some property needs to be conveyed back, if any at that point, you can put that language in the project agreement as well. And by then, you'll have a survey, and you'll know where you, what you're going to keep and what you would want to put into the development. That's why you start with the survey and the budget. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Good question. Thank you. Uh, OK, so it, it's forgot to, about the IDB right now, uh, about the land to the IDB, because you get a question at, as before that if we are conveying the land, there is nothing in this contract. We say that if the project doesn't go back, the IDB has to give us back the land. There is nothing in there. So if we don't convey the land to the IDB right now, I'm, I'm OK with that. Um, another staff I brought to, and that could be a, a quick fix, um, is that on 
I know it's going to be a survey of stuff, but uh, it says uh, possible retail, retail facilities. And uh, I don't like the word possible because I want to make sure that if we redevelop or oh, that the goal is we want to redevelop, we need to be in retail. So um, I think there should be a stronger language there to make sure we actually have retail there and not just uh, condominiums or apartments. That's, that can be done. Um, and again, uh, another concern I have, and I know we're going to have a year to do that, but I want to make sure that we are going to do our due diligence too, because they're going to do theirs, and we need to make sure that that's going to be feasible for us, because we're talking about a lot of money to move everything, and a lot of logistic too, uh, because if we move that building, from the time that building is going to be rebuilt, where are we going to put the government? We're actually, we've been having those conversations and thoughts and brainstorming just as we've explored. Mm -hmm. No answers yet, but we think yeah. we have some good ideas and some good paths to pursue. Uh, we talk about it, but I'm going to bring it here because that's one of my concerns about the parking garage where on the contract he said that uh, we're going to have to decide what the parking garage is, if we pay for it, if we don't, if we have to build it. So that's one of my concern, uh, and I know we have a good discussion there, and I think that should continue. Uh, so if we go all the way down to the contract, uh, and I would not, I would like to change something on the contract because I want us to be involved in that project uh, and not just because I can take five years, six years, so, and not just the mayor uh, on the decision making, even in, even in that. I think all of that will be spelled out in the project agreement, but what, what this MOU says this allows to is, sign an MOU. is the mayor or whomever this body allows to decide that. I mean, that's the language that's currently in the MOU. But I, I think that would be the whole body. And I think that should be specified. Uh, okay, but the MOU, I mean, I don't care who signs it, but. No, I don't think he's talking about signing it. He's talking about decisions, but that, I think those are the decisions that will be made with by this body. Not during the project agreement phase, not during the MOU. This is just the study phase that the MOU is, is controlling. If they would then come back with accurate, a proposal Mr. that Trent. we would assess as a body and make determinations as a body. Not yeah, but we have, in, even in the study phase, if we go through the milestone, uh, the first milestone, like you said, sir, is a pursuit budget. So, again, I... I want to be involved in that. I want to know what the pursuit budget we have to approve. That's what we've been, I mean, yes. I would not approve a budget without this body's feedback. May I, may I point out, it does say, or such other persons as the governing body of the city may delegate. So you may say that the governing body, which is you, needs the to body. approve the budget. I'm. That's completely up to you. And so if that's how you want to prove this, I think that's perfectly fine. But that was designed to give flexibility. So if you can certainly add that to your motion. At this point, we're just voting whether or not to move it forward to council or not. Um, you could, I guess, vote to send it forward with a potential amendment, but I mean, that's not a big uh, right, thing. right now, we only have a 30-day period to approve a budget. And so the question is, does that timing work for the whole group to have approved the budget? I, I don't know that. You'll have to answer that question if that's what you're asking. But, but the concept was 
that that you would figure out who you want to approve things like that in the meantime, because this is, again, just a decision to learn as much as you can. This is not going to have anything to do with the final approval of what you're going to build, where you're going to build it, how much you're going to spend. That's going to be in the project agreement. Make sense? Yes, sir. Um, I have to agree with Councilman Fennell that is, I'm like you, I'm trying to wrap my head around the hotel uh, there. Uh, I don't see I don't see a hotel here in the square. I, I can't. I can't figure that out. Uh, that's another another thing. Uh, I had questions sent to me, uh, and I know there's some we can't answer now. But uh, uh, one question sent to me was uh, by by one of my constituents was, um, will the new public buildings be built uh, prior to the developers starting? If we move forward, starting to build. I don't know what you said. I'm sorry. Well, the new public building is something. Yeah, we, the new public buildings will be built prior to uh, the... But I, I, I know what he's asking, uh, if I may. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, one of the things, well, first of all, the fire hall situation needs to be on an expedited timeline and separated from this conversation, I believe. The city does has identified property that may be no cost or very low cost, which fits perfectly for Chief Beeman's needs to serve the city. I can't share the details of that yet. I just don't have that permission. Um, but we hope that'll work out. So that would defray some of those costs by not having to buy any land, if that happens. What we have to decide after the due diligence when we're in the project agreement phase is do we want to design a new city hall separately and have it built separately and not be part of the construction of the overall block, so to speak? We will probably get an efficiency of cost, meaning it will save us money if one contractor built everything, including city hall. That doesn't mean that Boyle would mandate what goes in the city hall. We would decide how, what how many square feet it is, how it's laid out, all those sorts of things. So it is still a question to be answered. Um, and that we may decide we're going to move ahead with ours, but I, I suspect what you'll find is both things will be happening at the same time. And I can see conflict with two or three different contractors, one building the parking garage, one building City Hall, and one building the rest of their development and all on top, you know, fighting with each other over, you know, you hit that water line. I didn't hit that water line or whatever. It's your liability. But none of those decisions have been made, and that's part of your conversation for your project agreement. There's as far as the police department headquarters, I don't know their timeline for phase two. We kind of envisioned that that would come later. Um, that's also part of their feasibility study, so we might we think we have a little more time to decide where that's going to go and um, how to make that happen. If, did that help? Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, Pascal. Uh, another was, you know, that's one of the main concerns of people right now is about traffic. So um, I think I heard uh, the representative from board who said that they will look at that during the feasibility study. So I suppose we'll get an answer later. Um, and again, to go back to the land, uh, because when I look at the at the rendering right now, if uh, will the city hall, and I, I think it's probably for you, uh, will, will the city hall is going to be land? That means uh, we're going to cut. Uh, around the city hall and keep that as city land? Well, there would be, I, I guess it would probably be some process by which they would convey back to the city the land on which city hall would okay. be situated. So, um, but yes, the city would own the land that the city hall sits on. 
So now the, the question everybody has and uh, who, who came back to me a few times is the money side. Because, uh, and one of the questions I have here is that will the city make enough money on the sale of the property to cover the cost of the new buildings? I would say no on that, yeah. but, the, but you have to look at the economic impact and the revenue that would be generated over a period of time. And, you know, we kind of talked about, you know, what does this look like? Because, um, you know, on the one hand, all of these things are going to have to happen in the next several years. The fire hall, something done with city hall, the police department, all of those things are going to have to happen at some point. And this would bring new revenue to support all that that doesn't currently exist. So in my mind, I mean, I've said to these people from the very beginning, it's the economic feasibility that makes it work or ma doesn't make it work. And so, I mean, that's what we have to figure out. Um, so. Because uh, the revenue is not going to come back right away. So right. Uh, the main question is that are we going to finance? Because uh, if I take the numbers, uh, you say we're going to get 500k on on property tax a year. Uh, so, if I look at, um, I went to uh, the the last city hall got built. Uh, it was not Brentwood, but uh, Franklin. Uh, they spent 75 million dollar on the building. I don't know how much how much we're going to spend. Yeah, we're not going to do that. But that's going I feel to be real certain we're not going to do that. That's, Sorry, that, folks. That's still going to be expensive. So yeah. uh, to build build a full building and everything and change everything. So uh, how are we going to pay for that? And that that the main concern of how do we are going to have to issue a bond? Uh, Likely so, but those bonds costs should be covered if it makes sense when we get to the end of the project. And I think that, um, you know, something that we have to realize that it's not just about the revenue that comes into the city, it's the revenue that comes into our downtown merchants as a result of this and the revenue that comes into the city that's not on taxpayers' backs. So it's offsetting a lot of costs in a lot of different ways. So, I mean, we don't have the answer to that yet. Yes, ma'am. That's one of the main concerns of... Of course, our ours too. Or mine too, I should say. I, I just can vouch for Mr. <coughs> Brown being very non-fancy and frugal when it comes to uh, wanting new things. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, I certainly don't want to build a new building. I'm like, can't we just make this one work? But if you, if you, if you retrofit City Hall today, you have no income coming back to support. You still have to move out for a while. You have no income coming in to pay for the retrofit, which may only last you eight to 10, maybe a couple, three more years. Eventually, no, and, and you're down we... the road, you're gonna have to either build something new or do, again, another major million dollar overhaul of this building. And I, I would argue and say that it might get us 20 years, but at the end of the day, we're gonna spend the money to retrofit and then the money to rebuild. Uh, Mr. Fan. So. I think a point to make. I was here when this building was built, the police station. I was new to Gallatin relatively then. We're pushing 50 years. The population was, Tiny may know. 13,000, 14. Maybe. I mean, common sense tells you that we're going to have to make changes, and they're coming. But, I, but I mean, we need to get ahead of it. And this is not my frugality, but I really, I mean, this building. Um, is plenty big. I'm not even sure we need a building this big, but we do need a building with better use of space. And, you know, if you don't know, this building has a lot of bathrooms everywhere. It has kitchenettes everywhere, has large lobby space. Um, I think a much more efficient, in so many ways, building could be built that's not opulent, because I don't think that's true to who we are as a city. So, anyone else? Um, one thing I'd like to add is I had a conversation with someone who is very familiar with Gallatin today. And I have to remember, I'm 65. Uh, this project excites me, so I may be different than most people. But to your point, and you've said this before, Councilman Fan, there is a group of people who, um, not they're not all older, but it is 
difficult for older folks to see the value of a project like this, making this a destination place. But when you share the vision with millennials and Gen Zs and the alphas that are coming up, this is what they, they want unique. They want to come to a downtown and a stay in a fun hotel. And we have two other hotels in the pipeline to be built. So it's a fallacy that we don't need any more hotels. There are people who want to stay in them and they're generating revenue. Um, but we have to remember too, it is not a lasting vision for me necessarily. I don't know how much longer I will be on this earth but it is a place that will bring those younger folks into our downtown, into our community, and thus they will sustain Gallatin. Um, and they'll stay in the job force and they'll stay uh, residents of Gallatin. They'll wanna you know, have a family perhaps here. And so just remember, I think Stephen, are you a millennial? Okay. I don't want to speak for anybody else, but you have to be the only millennial on the council, maybe. So just remember to think a, a younger vision sometimes too. It's hard, even for me. We're I'm not building my forty-year-old son. We're yeah. looking to what the future. My thirty-year-old. Yeah. Thoughts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, go back. People need to come here, but again, uh, if we have an hotel on the square, I mean, people to use the hotel, they need to have things to do in the square not just a couple of restaurants or a couple of shopping stores. Um, I remember our, our director of Park and Rex made a good point where, you know, we need tournaments here to bring people. So I think we need, if we do something like that, we need to think on a bigger global scale uh, for people to come here for a reason and make it, make it a destination. So that means we, we should not stop just here. We need to look at the bigger picture to make sure that if we have a hotel here, the hotel is going to be valuable. That means we need, you know, Sean, you, you made plenty of comment about how our park look compared to other cities. So we need, we need to invest the money to make sure that if we build that, because it, it's exciting, okay? It's, it's exciting and we can agree or disagree, but still exciting. But we need to make sure that people are going to come uh, to make sure it's viable when it's built. So um, that's, and there's so much information to digest that uh, that's going to be a Well, and I appreciate be a process. that. But somebody made the comment earlier this evening, and I think there's a lot of truth to it, that people are not investing in our community without knowing what the demand is. They're not going to risk that kind of investment. That now, do we... Do we always need to strive to do better and make our community more attractive, especially to people who aren't going to move here but just visit here, spend their money, and go home? Absolutely. Jen's working on that. Um, but I think between our history, between our athletics, and proximity to Nashville, we have a lot of appeal. Would you believe that n not so much here in this role but in my previous role, I would have so many people walk through the door and say, we're so excited we came to Gallatin because we've never seen a courthouse square before. And I had no clue because I grew up with it and I didn't think a thing in the world about it. But it is a destination for some people to travel around the country and see, um, see those historic squares. Mm -hmm. but but you, Mr. Fan, I'm sorry. What you just said just reminded me of something. I had a former relative and they had a motorcycle club and their destination <clears throat> Once a month, they would travel to a courthouse square in Georgia. They were out of Georgia. And that was their hobby, but they would go visit and they'd eat, eat locally. I can see that benefiting us. But what I really was going to say, I think we're talking this to death. I get the feeling we want to see what's happening. So whatever we need to do to make a motion, let's move it forward. Yeah. Can I have a motion, Mr. Payne? Yes. Okay. Second. Motion by Mr. Payne to move it forward. Second by Councilwoman. Carter, did you say? I'm George. Huh? I'm a man. Oh, geez. Well, it's because I started to say Councilwoman George, and I thought, wait, I think I heard Councilman but Carter. But that first. is the second. That's history. why I've done that, I bet, because I'm thinking one and then the other, because I do try to spread around the seconds and the motions. So, 
Councilman Carter and Councilwoman George seconded that motion. <laughs> so we have a motion and a second. We have the opportunity to continue discussion if you want. I do want to follow up on something you just said because it made me think of something. Um, it's amazing to me the events that have been created in Gallatin in the last five and ten years. This shamrock run in the rain on Saturday was the biggest ever, and people were enjoying it thoroughly. Um, you'll recall we had that bandit run thing, which I thought was like the craziest thing, but it brought so many people to Gallatin. Um, years Take ago, off. huh? The airplane thing? The, oh, yeah, the, the stole. Um, it's coming back. And I was going to mention the Comic Con because Town Square um, Comics right up here started that three years ago, and they started with the Leave It to Beaver reunion. I think they did that two years. Then last year they had the Dukes of Hazard reunion. And actually got a call from them last week for what's coming this year. And it's actually something I can relate to. And I, I'm like, oh, my goodness. I can't tell. It's, it's not my story to tell. But he wanted to share with me, and they'll announce it soon. But I am so incredibly excited that these things keep yeah. happening in our community. And they're not necessarily, you know, and sometimes government supported, but not government generated. The Chamber's doing so many fabulous events. The Museum's doing fabulous events. So we have nonprofits doing events. And then we have businesses doing events. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a lot of synergy and forward positive momentum. Um, in fact, we're talking about Southwater Corridor. I think I've told you about it, but I've had a really fascinating conversation about a, an attractive amenity in the Southwater Corridor. Got a meeting later this week about another amenity I didn't even know was a thing, but apparently it is. Um, there's a lot of interest in this community for things. I think this is important. Not houses, but things that are he, are um, making our community attractive is because of the houses. I didn't say that very well. There are a lot. Of, there's a lot of interest in our community based on the growth that has happened here. Can I say and what it's they not think? houses, so that's a good thing. Can I say one thing before we call the question? Sure. Uh, when we visited the place in Franklin, a lot of the history of Franklin was associated with that place. The pictures, if you remember, a lot of stuff about it. So I think if a lot of people, if they could travel there and see what some of us seen, that they would have more of an understanding of what I envision on being in this area if it was to. And they had local art. They had art that kind of told some of the history of the area, but right. they also had some artifacts framed. I remember that, too. I hadn't thought of that. Mr. Schwartz. Um I would like to make an amendment. I, I talked about it before, and I think, uh, I can't remember the name, but our legal IDB, um, about 5-A, uh, reference to approval by the city shall mean the approval by the mayor or such other person as a governing body of the city may designate, I think, <coughs> the reg. I'd like to see if we can amend that and change to reference to approval by the city shall mean the approval by the mayor and the governing body of the city. Governing body, the mayor doesn't get to vote, so. I think that makes it a lot simple. Uh, and I keep everybody involved. It says the mayor or the choice of the body. So I, I feel like it's covered in there, but just to satisfy the concerns, I think I'm OK with it. I don't care. So do we need to withdraw? No. No, okay. it would be an amendment. Just, just, just changing the verb. Gotcha. Make a motion to amend as stated. A if motion it's okay. to amend. Second. I'm second by Councilman Carter. Any discussion on the proposed amendment? All in favor of the proposed amendment? Ch ch basically, simple language change. Ch please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. Okay, it passes uh, 6 to 1 unless someone corrects me. Um, so we'll go back to the original motion as amended. Any further questions before we vote? Okay, all in favor of moving ordinance. Wait, I'm sorry. Resolution R2402-17 forward to council as amended. Please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. Thank okay. you for a very robust conversation. Mm. That's exactly what we hope for. We really do appreciate it. And I want to give a shout out to my colleague, Lily Beth Leon, who's, it's just her and me right now, so we're a team and we're getting <coughs> things done. So well, thank you. Good job. Thank you, Ms. Bates. Thank you, Ms. Oh, Leon. Like and to thank you. I'd like to make a suggestion, too, if, if the city has some way of doing it, I'm sure we do. 
We need to inform the public this is not killing the square. <laughs> well, again, you know, I, I, I was very dismayed to see information get out that made it look yeah. like we were going to make a decision this evening and next week mm -hmm. as to plow down this whole block and build something new that nobody had an idea about. That would be ridiculous. But, you know, I think people felt like that that was the trajectory we were on, and it's not. But thank you, Ms. Bates. Thank you, Ms. Leon. Thank you, Mr. Trent and, and um, the other folks that were here supporting. We appreciate y'all. Um, and we will probably look to you with questions in the future. Um, I think, did we vote? Mm -hmm. Did we vote? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> It got, it got, it was pretty, you know, excellent. Okay, well, good. Okay, excellent. Wow. And I actually did take a bathroom break. If anyone else needs to, you're welcome to. Um, but we will move on. I don't think we'll be too much longer. Um, ordinance, um, item number four is ordinance 02403-14. It's amending the Gallatin Municipal Code, Chapter 5, Buildings and Building Regulation by adopting the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code with amendments per state requirements. Mr. Stewart. Uh, Chuck Stewart, building official. Uh, I want to uh, <coughs> tell you a little history on this uh, ordinance here. We are in the in the in the middle of uh, code adoption. It is time to move uh, Gallatin to the uh, 2024 building codes, and I decided I wanted to move this ordinance outside of that adoption. I want it to be a standalone. Uh, we laid on your uh, station this afternoon uh, the state law. If you notice the date on it, state law. They showed up in my office last year and said, this is what you're going to do. And I said, it's my typical self. No, I'm not. <laughs> and we have been fighting them since last July, along with other building officials across the state. Basically, what this does, it reduces uh, what we're doing now. It will make our homes and our businesses less energy efficient by adopting this. However, the building code states that we cannot supersede uh, local, state, or federal law with the building codes. We have to do this whether we want to or not. And if you're noticing the bill is on the floor up there now, there uh, a lot of them direct at building departments. And so that's why we're bringing this in as a standalone, and we want it noted in our ordinance that this is as per state. Even the International Code Council doesn't agree with this, but this is what the state of Tennessee does. Also, the code book tells us we can make codes more stringent than what the code, the building codes and plumbing codes, all these codes are minimum. This is the minimum you can do to build a home or build a, a building here. This is the minimum you have, to, you have to meet. So our codes are more stringent. We have added a lot to our codes here in Gallatin to make them more stringent because my passion was for a safe city when I arrived here. And this seemed like it's been 100 years ago, but it's only been about 11 but we've come a long ways, okay, to make this a safe city. We don't have a lot of fires anymore. We make our buildings safe, okay? And I've heard people come to this podium in the last few weeks saying this building can't build this terrible, builds a terrible house. Not in Galton, he doesn't. I can promise you he don't. He gets more inspections than he gets in any other jurisdiction around us, and he gets that more in-depth inspection for what goes on out there. So. This department's doing a great job. These inspectors, it's not me, it's the inspectors are doing a great job out there. And this is a hard pill for me to swallow, but we're going to have to ask you to uh, move this forward for us. Motion to move to council. Motion by Councilman Jumont. Second. Second by Councilman Fennell. Any questions, any discussion? Appreciate your explanation you. on that. Um, Ordinance, I actually remember that time. Or, well, heck, last time I couldn't remember. Ordinance 02403 dash, sorry, 14. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Moves forward unanimously. Item 5 is Ordinance 02403 dash 15, awarding bid and authorizing funds in the total amount of 330000 from water sewer 2021 bond sales for the Franklin Street Water Line Replacement Project, contract 224. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Uh, this is an ordinance to appropriate funding for a small water line replacement project. It'll be Franklin Street from Northwater to Boyers. Um, this project came up as part of the parking garage stormwater improvements. We actually have... Supportive of the stormwater installation that needs to happen with the parking garage. 
and it uh, it uh, reinforces our supply downtown. So it's a good thing. Thank you, Mr. Kellogg. Do you have a vote? All in favor of resolution. I'm sorry, ordinance 02403-15, please say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Item number six, it passes unanimously. Item six is resolution R2403-21, resolution accepting public improvements by the city of Gallatin and Carrollton phase six. Mr. Tuttle. Oh, no, sorry. Aaron, Mr. Higson. Thank you, Mayor. This is a resolution accepting the public infrastructure for Carrollton phase six, which includes a portion of Gulfstream Drive and Black Walnut Drive. Planning Commission did approve this unanimously at the February 26th meeting. Motion to move to council. Motion by Councilwoman George. Second by Vice Mayor Love. Any questions, any discussion? Mr. Schwartz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm gonna abstain on that one because I got uh, contacted by a constituent want me to look at it. So. Um, I didn't have time to do that, so I'm just going to abstain. Hearing his evaluated the roads before we approve them. <laughs> it's better, better yes, have. Um, yeah, but thank you for your explanation. I understand. Um, any other questions, comments? This is resolution R2403-21. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-1. No, 4-1-2-4. Uh, one, no, I'm sorry, five zero one abstention. Goodness gracious, it's been a long day. Yeah. Um, that concludes the regular agenda. It brings us now to other business. Um, anyone with any other business? Mr. I do For the past couple of years, I've noticed that the activity on the lake is getting more and more. Uh, we have discussed about a patrol boat. Um, also know that, that Don has contacted TWRA and they're willing to uh, donate a boat for the purpose of, uh, give us two boats, one or two boats for the purpose of being able to do some type of patrolling in the Lock 4 area, uh, the Ski Cove area, and Station Camp area. I see a need for that maybe on Saturday and Sundays, but I'd like to add that to the work session to try to discuss that a little bit, if possible. Second. By Councilman Finnell, second by Councilman Juvats. Any questions, any discussion? Will they be able to write tickets? Can yes. Can our department write tickets? That's what Don told me, yes. I, uh, I think you know, budgetary analysis is real key in that, so I don't know where we will be. Was it proper motion or do I need to withdraw? No, it's it? a proper motion because you're just asking for discussion, right. but I'm saying that even if we receive the boat, there are staffing concerns and storage concerns and that kind of thing. So, um, so motion a second. Any further questions, discussion? Okay, all in favor of adding that to the next work session? Aye. Uh, Say aye. Aye. <laughs> I'm making a note at the same time I'm having you vote. Police boat discussion, next work session. I assume you're, you're talking during the boating season too, right, Sean? Yes, I am. I want people to think it's going to be. It, you know, the thing of it is, is, is have a, a trailer come with a boat, and he's able to take it in and out. If an emergency happened, you go, he could always deploy. But I think that we need to have some type of support or presence seen on the lake, especially like on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday during the boating season. Makes sense. Motion to move to council. Any other other business? I have something. Mr. White, um, Mr. Javant's record. Oh, go ahead. He, he asked before me. He was, he was in line. Huh? What? Y'all work it out. Yeah, go, go. All right. Um, I've been asked to announce that the Gallatin Center for Rehab will have an Easter event on Saturday, March 23rd from 12 to 3. It's a free event for the community. Everybody is welcome. They're going to have popcorn, cotton candy, bounce houses, um, an Easter egg hunt, pictures with the Easter bunny, Maggie Moose, and much more. What time did you say? 12 to 3. That's on the 23rd. 23rd, yes. That is yes, that sir. All? For you? That's all. That's it for me, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just quick two things. Uh, the first one is an update on the vote of our charter change. I was on the uh, on the committee today um, and uh, didn't pass. What's that pass? What the the change of charter for impact fees? Uh, on the impact fees? Yeah, didn't pass the. Come out at the state. On the outside, yeah. Didn't was it pass. presented today? 
Yeah, that was presented today. I was there. Uh, our uh, William Slater presented it. That was a good experience. There was actually uh, some interesting discussion about it. So um, I took a lot of lot of direction to where to go and what they want to see. So I'm not done with it. I'm going to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, I know it's funny. Some people work. Uh, I'm going to go back to the drawing board and talk with Susan and see what we can do. And I will bring something who uh, align more with what looks like they want to uh, make it pass. So that what was, was the vote count? Um, they didn't do a roll call, so that was there was plenty of people. A bipartisan? Uh, that was probably 75, 25, I suppose, around there, 60, 30. They're not in, they're not in favor of an impact fee that we've been. They, the, they, they had few concerns. One, one of the concerns was that we didn't have any cap on it. So they look at what happened, I think, in Brentwood, where they have insane impact fees, and they concern about that. So that was one of the concerns. And the second concern they had was that uh, they're more on the residential side. They don't really want the uh, commercial side to be impacted by it. So um, I'm sure there's something we can do. I'm going to talk with our rep tomorrow morning and see what he thinks, and I'll get back to you. On Paige, was you involved in this? No. And I mean, I'll mention again, um, you know, what I've said for a while now. If you go back historically for all the requests that have come to, I, I assume it was local government committee or mm -hmm. city and towns committee or something, but um, all the requests that have come, they ask random questions, um, but there is just some resistance to impact fees, which to me doesn't feel fair because, you know, general charter cities can impact, can mm -hmm. put impact fees in, but private act cities can't. And so it's very, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. And, and like I've said before, there's lots of discussions about Tassler's evaluating it. Um, you know, TML has it on their legislative agenda. You know, try and get the legislator to, legislature to allow um, impact fees with guardrails for mm -hmm. cities. And, you know, counties are asking the same thing. But I think probably... I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the legislative position is or what the genesis of that is, but it's been that way for over a decade, where they have turned down every request that has come to them there's, for there's, impact fees. But um, you warned us. I can't lie. Well, I, mean, I know. I yeah. watch it. But I do you think did. that, I mean, I don't know why it's that feeling, but I think at this point it's probably affordable housing that plays, in, plays but, into it. And there was actually an interesting task report from, from our last meeting that said, you know, affordable impact fees can actually help affordable housing mm -hmm. because it, well, there's a whole explanation there. I'll butcher it. Trying there's to so it. much out there in the um, social media about us and impact fees, just like us. Oh, I know. I mean, I. Moratoriums I, out there. And, I, I, you know, we've been over the moratoriums and over I, moratoriums. And I have, you know, explained as kindly as I can to you know, some people on the county commission that Gallatin does not have the authority by which to impart that impact fees. We don't. It's because we are a private act. And it's really kind of counter to what makes sense because really the private act cities are your older cities and your general charter are your newer cities. So, but it's the situation that it is. But it's just... Um, but I hate that I didn't know that it was in committee today. It's just, uh, I guess, informing the public of the truth and, and what's really going on, because so much stuff gets spun up. Well, it's you mentioned moratoriums. Correct. Moratoriums, you have to prove look what, infrastructure well, deficiency. Look what happened to us tonight as far as uh, the proposal for the Phoenix thing. I mean, people thought we was voting on doing something right now. And yeah. it's, I don't know how that got started, that rumor, but it was it was not correct, obviously. And, a lot of things did not go as they should, but I think we had a very healthy discussion tonight. I appreciate everyone's involvement in that, um, and, you know, we move forward, right? Mr. Chance. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, you warned me about that, but I still push because that's how I am, and I'm still going to keep doing because I think we need that. So um, my second staff, I would like to put, to put on the next work session, uh, talk with 
legal about it. There is a discrepancy with uh, what we get charged at the Resource Authority Board. And um, I think we need to look at that uh, because if there are rules, they're supposed to follow the rules. And if there is an amount they're supposed to charge us, at what they should charge us. So uh, I would like to make a discussion to see well, yeah. how we're going to fix that. I mean, I think I think you said you're making a motion. Is that what you said? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, we have a motion. If anybody would like to second it, I don't understand I what don't it was. Understand. I'm sorry. He he wants a motion to discuss um, the resource authority going beyond their agreement and charging us um, fees. Um, the reality is, is we are a two seventh owner of the facility, and even if they did have to restitute us for exceeding what they charge us, they would turn around and have to charge us more because. They'd have to offset what that impact was. I think the right course is to update that agreement. Um, no, but uh, well, what I'm seeing is that there is a written agreement, basically, and they don't follow it. So we need to fix it. If they want to charge us more money, we need to fix it. I have no problem with them charging us more money. What the problem I have is that we have a written agreement to fix a maximum amount of money they can charge us, and they went over that without us approving it, and that's what's written in the agreement. So we need to fix it. That just, that, yeah, that's just my only thing. Yeah, and I think thing. we know that, and I think you've actually been working with the Resource Authority attorney to get an updated agreement so that we can... Oh, I've dis we have discussed the we have need discussed, for that. We have discussed the need for that. That's where we are currently. So I don't know if that is something that they craft or that if they don't, it would... I mean, I think we would just do an amendment to the agreement. But it would be something that we would both... Everyone would... We would have to agree on it, and the Resource Authority Board would have to agree to it. So don't, we don't have a quorum anymore anyway, do we? Or do we? We do. We, do. we have four people. But um, No one else can leave. So you've made a motion. Nobody seconded it. My suggestion would be that we just move forward with updating the agreement and get it on the work session when we have an agreement to present to this body. Would that be acceptable? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Anyone else with any other, other business? Okay. Department heads, anyone with any reports that you would like to share this evening? They want to go eat dinner, and I understand. All right. One more motion. Motion to adjourn. Motion by Councilman Carter. <laughs> Second by Councilman Pinnell. All in favor say aye. Aye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for running with us this evening. Have a lovely night, and I wish you all the very best. Be kind to one another.